Okay, welcome back everybody. Also, those who are joining us online from around the world, I believe over a thousand are joining us as we speak. Probably still in their pajamas, which is fine because you're all online. Uh, luckily, we have these wonderful, beautiful people joining us in the room today. Lovely to have you back with us. I'm not sure whether you just heard the breaking news. Um, this is true. Uh, do have a look, but apparently they found a suspicious package uh, at Downing Street, Whitehall. They've actually evacuated the entire... It's true. You think I'm joking. It's actually online. I reckon that suspicious package is probably the former Chancellor's tax reforms. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I'll be here all week. Um, <laughs> some of you have been really upset, and uh, it, it pains me personally that uh, you, some of you wanted to answer a couple of those questions that I asked previously. So we're gonna give you the opportunity. So uh, we're gonna single people out, and he's looked at me and he said, I want to be asked. <laughs> if we have a microphone, if we can get the microphone over to that very handsome gentleman there in the light blue jacket. Uh, one of, you can answer one of two questions. What would you like to have done? What is your childhood ambition you would like to have realized that perhaps you were thinking about when you were five, or, if we were doing the story of your life, who would play you, and what genre of film would it be? Which of those questions you'd like to answer? Would you like to stand up for us? <laughs> Give a round of applause. Right. <laughs> Afternoon, Gifford Rankin from JMB, Jamaica. Um, at five, I was saying, oh my God, I'm dying to be 18 because then I could move out and you know have a great apartment. <laughs> Still waiting, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, at five, I, th I thought I was going to be a lawyer, but it didn't happen. <laughs> oh, bless. But you're doing important work now. I work for Sharon, yes. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Who else would like to answer this question? I know there's people dying to... I, I would love you to answer this question. I know there's something about you that's screaming, ask me the question. Uh, can we kind of get the microphone to a lovely gentleman? What would you like to have done? if you weren't in this very special industry that you're in right now. Give, give them a round of applause first for a brave soul. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, David again. <laughs> um, I wanted to be a big um, worldwide, you know, wrestling guy when I was five. Wow. Yeah. And um, if someone's going to act me, I have to be The Rock. Yes. Yeah? Brilliant. Absolutely. So that's it. Didn't what? happen. But is it, did you try at any time? Um, yes. You did? Yeah, many times in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you had one, but what would be your wrestling name? Or maybe we have some ideas here from the crowd. Yeah, what money, would it be? Money Remeter. The what, sorry, that? The Money Remeter. The Money Remeter, I love it, that's good. <laughs> Very good. Right, let's ask another one. Who would, like, who would actually like to put their hand up and say, I'd like to answer that question? Let's see who's a brave soul here in this room. One more of you, and then we can go to our panel discussion. How about that lovely lady there, right in front, who, who actually wants to answer the question, is pretending she doesn't want to? What's your, let's have a round of applause first for you. Thank you so much. Which of those two questions would you like to answer? Uh, what was I going to be at five? Yes. So I was going to be a teacher, mm -hmm. and I feel like I've indirectly become a teacher because uh, heading up the trade association, I have to teach regulators all the time about the industry. So not a complete um, departure, departure yes. from what I want it to be. Well, there you are. Thank you so much for that. Brilliant. Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you all so much for taking part. We're, I'm going to be asking some strange and weird questions a bit later. So those of you who think you've got away with it, you haven't. So, so there you go. What I'd like to do is introduce our next session. Now, this is about mobile money and the utilisation of super apps. Now, as neighbouring industries unite and the money transfer industry continues its shift from brick and mortar to digital models, the need for super apps and fintech enablers becomes even more apparent. Now in this session, you can join our experts in analyzing the opportunities brought about by these super apps and how they're being utilized for mobile wallets and transfers. Now I'd like to introduce our wonderful panelists for today. Firstly, I'd like to introduce um, Nika Nagavi. Uh, she's a, in charge of expanding the MFS Africa's footprint 
and managing relationships with MNOs to unlock growth opportunities and to position MFS Africa as a key player in the payment ecosystem. She has authored several key reports, including the flagship State of the Industry Report on Mobile Money and produced the very first large sample quantitative analysis on the expansion of digital financial services in collaboration with Harvard Business School and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Please give a round of applause to Nika. Now, Leon, what can I say about Leon? He did so. I said, this room's getting a bit warm. He said, yes, it is. It probably goes a lot of hot air from the last two sessions. Um, so, Leon, thank you so much. You should be doing this job. Uh, Leon is joining us as a CEO and founder of the DMA Global uh, Organization. He's a seasoned expert and business leader in the payments and international development fields with particular expertise in migrant remittances. He has over 30 years of hands-on experience. Thank you so much, Leon. And we also have um, Ned, who has extensive experience in the payments industry, having previously worked within the world of card acquiring and processing. Transitioning to the world of cross-border payments, Ned is one of Currency Cloud's experts working within the remittance and financial service industry. Welcome, Ned Barker. <laughs> Lovely picture. Um, now, moderating today's session is Ababakar Sek. He has extensive experience and sound expertise in the money transfer business, particularly in the African market. He he's also was the CEO of Money Express and Connect Africa Payments and contributed to the launching of several initiatives in the field. Let's hear for Ababakar Sek. <laughs> This panel will be for one hour, followed by 30 minutes or so of questions and answers. Uh, for those of you here, we'll come to you with a microphone. If you kindly give us your name and the question, and then we'll be taking some uh, questions also from our virtual audience. Thank you. You can clap. It's okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start with your questions. I have plenty of questions, and I hope with our experts that we will benefit from your insights. Okay? I will start first with Ned. Ned, can you please define what is a super app? What it is, as we are starting to hear more about it. Yeah, sure. Um, lovely to be here. Um, apparently, there's quite a lot of pressure on me um, because not many people know what a super app is. So I'm going to give my definition and then I'm going to um, talk about a conversation I had with Leon about five minutes ago. So to me, a super app is defined by a single application that embodies multiple consumable services within a single user interface. So the way that Leon described it to me is actually much better. Imagine every application on your mobile phone that you rely on on a day-to-day -day basis in one place, and you never have to leave that interface. So whether it's Uber, um, delivery, paying your rent, you know, mobile banking, whatever it might be. For me, the thing that defines a super app is, is, is three key areas. So the first one is a wallet or a payment functionality, whether that's being able to store funds or being able to have multiple payment options from the application. The second thing is a connection to social media, so whether that's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it might be. And the third thing is a communication capability. So that might be um, an in-house messaging platform, access to WhatsApp, um, any of those things. So, as a salesperson, I've always believed that actually uh, specialists are much better than generalists. But what we're seeing is, um, as specifically the remittance market becomes um, uh, more competitive, more diluted, people are having to innovate in lots of different ways to try and um, generate new revenue streams. So actually, super apps are kind of bucking this trend uh, and are enabling people to become more generalist in their revenue streams than, than being specialists. Um, I think that remittance has a really interesting opportunity here because at the core of all of this is, is a payment. Um, and generally, if you can um, run a company that can be uh, compliant and you understand how money moves, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges that these kinds of apps generally have. Um, I'd also argue that um, if you look at maybe aspiring super apps, people like Netflix, um, Spotify, Uber, um, You know, would you trust Uber with making a payment from one place to another? Um, I certainly wouldn't. 
Um, the, the conversations that I've had with um, multiple aspiring super apps, um, the assumption is that, that the payments is easy and actually payments is really difficult. You need to understand compliance, you need to understand the regulators, you know, local laws, international money movement, and that's the most complicated thing. Um, so, I would just say that a super app, you know, it's a world of opportunity. It has to, con it has to embody multiple consumable um, applications, but at the core of a super app, you've got um, some kind of payment uh, mechanism, whether it's to store funds or pay, um, a social um, media or connectivity option, um, and the ability to, to, to message within, within the application. Uh, thank you very much, Ned. Uh, if one of our panelists want to add something before we go to the second question, any perspective? It was clear enough, okay? It was really clear. <laughs> it was really clear. Thank you very much, Ned. Uh, our s second question is for Leon. In Africa, more and more mobile money operators are getting an EMI license. Uh, will this change the landscape and how for you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because regardless of whether we're talking about super apps, it's a, actually a bigger, bigger opportunity and a, a bigger issue. And I think, you know, if you look at Africa in particular, we've heard this morning um, a lot about how Africa has been the, the cradle of mobile remittances in particular. I think the figures from MFS, which Nika, I know you can give us, show, you know, there's about half a, half a billion people have a mobile account and so on. And yet, if you look at the number of operators that there actually are, in the mobile space in, in Africa, it's relatively small, and in many cases, they're quite restricted in what they can actually do compared to their potential. So I think as markets open up, particularly in Africa, um, to mobile operators, because you know, they're not just offering a payment from A to B, they're offering a whole platform with different services. They have a great potential to, in the remittances space, to um, bring more efficiency in cost. We already know that mobile remittances, I think the GSMA most recent data, which was out this week, um, which we collected for them, said that the cost is 3.73% to send a mobile payment to mobile payment from anywhere in the world, compared to 6.03% for all remittance types, so significantly cheaper. But I think what we we'll also see is that you can do a lot more with mobile, when mobile remittance um, MNOs get licenses. In some countries, of course, they can become quasi banks. You look at the payment services uh, set up in uh, Nigeria, for instance, and other countries now will enable much more of that. And I think it will bring more competition. It could bring lower pricing. It will certainly bring um, the opportunity to improve financial inclusion if it's done properly. And it obviously brings a much broader reach than some traditional um, uh, operators can get to. But we shouldn't think that <laughs> that's the answer to all our challenges, really, because at the end of the day, we're coming back to the super app, excuse my ignorance, but I assume if it's a super app, you have to have an app-based phone. And we know in Africa, we're still running a lot on USSD. So it's uh, in the topic of this uh, particular session, it may not be the complete answer or not now in, it, in all countries, but actually in terms of just improving the remittances and financial inclusion markets, I think it has to be a good thing. Thank you, Leon. Nika, you have one thing to add? I think on EMI license generally, I don't know, my mic is working, yeah. So on EMI license generally, um, once you um, get the license, you're less dependent on other uh, uh, basically regulatory um, coverage institutions such as banks. So that means that the less you, participants you have in the value chain, you can be more uh, competitive on pricing. I mean, no pricing is not, and cost is not one um, hurdle, but we're all here because we're looking at that SDG 10C and reducing the cost of remittances to 3% uh, or 5%, not going higher than 5% in most corridors. So the less players you have in the value chain, the easier it is for you to uh, reduce the cost because everyone wants a piece of pie. 
Um, at the same time, you can offer beyond remittances, you can offer other services, such as um, ability to do e-commerce, credit with obviously with another bank in, in partnership, but things that are not um, um, easy for a telco without an EMI license to offer. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going back to Ned again uh, with a long question. Uh, how can we develop an all-encompassing wallet, universal mobile bank account? Example, a mobile wallet that can do all sorts of transactions from wallet. What does it take for the vendors to create this type of wallet? Can it be done alone, or will there need to be a collaboration among players? Yeah, so I get asked this a lot, um, and I think for most remittance companies who are um, digitizing, having a, a universal wallet is kind of the next step. Um, the thing that I would say is that, um, honestly, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I'm going to put three points again, um, and I'm just going to touch on each of them. So the first one is, when we're creating these wallets, looking at the, the business itself, not at, at the consumer, is um, how are we actually going to monetize the wallet? And also, what is the USP of that wallet? Because in a, a very diluted world, we need to be able to stand out, and we need to be able to monetize. The second part, and probably the most important actually, is, is compliance. Um, a lot of people get compliance wrong or misunderstand compliance and have this view of um, an all-encompassing borderless wallet, which, which you know, some companies do very well, but actually uh, there's a lot going on under the hood that people don't see. And then the last thing is, is partnerships. So how do we partner either to get to market faster, to test, um, or to give the certain services to the experts that, that they're actually going to deliver these services? So. I'll just touch on monetization. Um, you know, how do we make money out of it, right? Because um, there's a cost of um, opening these accounts. There's a cost of storing funds on behalf of your customers. There's a cost of holding multiple currencies. And I think there's an education piece around this. Um, but that's usually the first question I ask. Um, on the compliance, uh, there's some misconceptions between like wallets and storing funds and, and generally accounts. And it differs from country to country, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Different regulators have different you know, understandings of it. Um, and I'd say that, that most companies who are looking to transition to this all-encompassing wallet, generally very, you know, they, they don't forecast how much it's actually going to cost them to even to store their customer funds, which is one of the biggest you know, hurdles um, in this. Um, the last point I made was around um, partnerships. So it's incredibly important, in, in, in honesty. So you have two choices. One is you go and build it yourself, which can take a long time. You know, connecting into banks, connecting into um, other um, payment service providers, um, connecting into countries can take a long time. So partnering with people that already have those connections and already have local knowledge is, is really important. Um, and then also, um, what was the last point I made? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's really around, um, it, it can be payments, regulation, um, onboarding, you know, security, any of these things we can partner on. Um, and having the local knowledge in, in the country where you're trying to acquire customers from is, 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 is key. Um, so the first one, it can be done, but finding a USP and finding how we monetize customers is really important. Um, the second one is um, compliance is definitely king. Um, I say it to everyone, like invest in compliance. Um, the person who's making sure that your business is compliant is usually the person you should be paying the most. Um, and the last one is partnerships. In my experience, partnering with people who have the expertise in the, in the sector, whether that's security, whether that's onboarding, or whether, whether it's FX, they are in the industry because they are experts. You know, we can't be experts of everything. So, so partnering to get to market faster is also key. Thank you very much, Ned. Anything our other panelists can add? Or is clear enough for everybody? I, I think I have a fundamental problem with the question here. Why do we need a universal wallet? Why? Like, I, I think before we even think, because we, we, we hear, so the main reason that we see financial inclusion adva advancing is because there is competition, a healthy competition. If you have a universal wallet that brings in all the financial services together, how, um, as a service provider, single service provider, how can you be incentivized to go after acquiring customers? Then, because when you're 
over like including everything in the same environment um, then it means that from customer support from your USB etc you have to have a universal approach to that as well um, and you cannot offer the quality of a serv a quality of the service that the consumer needs um, or I, I'm, I'm not getting the question so why do we need, why do we need a universal wallet for me that's so, so interesting I actually tend to agree with you I think that sometimes people forget that even from country to country people use applications and use their money differently you know some countries will borrow some countries don't some countries send money some countries don't so I don't think that the, the global view is necessarily the right one um, I think there's sometimes an argument for it's easier to create a global wallet if you're going after international markets particularly in the b2b space so if you have a universal wallet but you're based in the UK you can on onboard customers in the US for example and also in Europe now that doesn't work because you need to be regulated on both sides but I think that's the kind of the view people are trying to make it easier for themselves to acquire more customers um, but I agree with you I think it, it, it's not necessarily the right thing for, for those reasons understanding the local markets understanding the customers understanding the products that they're going to get and the context and we were just talking about um, the super apps and where for instance in Africa eight out of tra 10 transactions are on USSD menu um, how can you create a universal wallet that is going to be inclusive and it's not going to exclude everyone else who's using USSD uh, and basic in feature forms? So I think that focus should be on things that really move the needle. And there is more like not on the, I think, on the user front and offering uh, different services. There's plenty of innovation. I think main innovation needs to happen on the regulatory front and um, the dialogue between the private and public sector on how we can educate the regulators, as she was mentioning, on how, what are these services, why we care about, for instance, remittances, um, why we care about um, delivery and cost of uh, uh, certain delivery of these services across the world. So I think the focus should be on that on when it comes to innovation, not on creating something universal that is going to, not going to be inclusive. Can I just come in on that? Because I think it's really interesting, apart from feeling like the net in a tennis game, um, is that, um, I mean, I think a lot of it depends where you start from. I mean, it seems to me we were having this discussion earlier that this has originated in China and then sort of spread out from there. And you look at the Chinese market, the number of people, uh, you know, the population, one point something billion, et cetera, probably there's some good cases for there. And it's sort of moved out from there. But I think you have to look at it from the customer viewpoint. Does the customer want a super app? And, you know, I think I was described as seasoned earlier, which really means just old. Um, and I, so I think, but if you look at how people use their apps, those who have apps, they want everything quicker, faster, simpler, and whatever. And I can imagine for those communities, this could be quite an attractive solution. If I don't have to go to a different app, even if it's the next one on my phone, that might be seen as a big benefit for people who just don't want to spend any time doing anything, right? But in many ways, I think the discussion is being driven from the supplier side is what can we create and how can uh, we create it? So I think we have to understand more about what is the consumer demand for this. And then I think we also have to say, maybe global is wrong, perhaps it's regional or perhaps it's certain types of countries because exactly as you said, for Africa, this may not be appropriate, but for Southeast Asia, this could be fantastically appropriate and may get products delivered to more people more quickly, etc. So I'm actually with you on Super App. Super App, I think, is the future of uh, where we see the industries going as a whole because you have Normally, if uh, you look at any transactions end to end, even in Africa today, every time someone says a domestic transfer, it's followed by a WhatsApp uh, message to say, have you received it? So bringing all of that into the same space makes sense. And what makes even more sense is that if you have an environment that you can discover different services, that will be key in terms of enhancing financial inclusion. And what do I mean by that is that you're an M-Pesa user and you're looking for micro insurance and if you have the ability to through that marketplace your mpesa super app find different providers who can give you access to micro insurance services and you can basically gauge and see which one gives you the best option 
That is uh, fundamental in improving financial health, etc. But when we talk about universal, I thought that you're talking about something that is universally acceptable across our all basically um, jurisdictions. And we know that's not going to work because context really matters and one size doesn't fit all. So the needs of someone sitting in the UK, whether they're diaspora or uh, sending money home or whether they're, whether they're domestic users of a super app is very different from someone sitting in uh, rural Ghana in the, in the coast border of Cote d'Ivoire because they're looking at different needs and they have uh, different uh, basically basic and daily, uh, daily use cases. Thank you very much, Nika. I mean, one of your points has to uh, go to the next question regarding inclusion, financial inclusion. Why does financial inclusion matter today? Should I start? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so I think, um, first of all, financial inclusion is not an end. It's um, a means to an end or many ends. And we're looking at uh, things like prosperity, financial health, ability to actually um, anticipate and um, uh, protect yourself against future shocks, etc. So when we mean financial inclusion is do an entry door to many other benefits uh, and many other development uh, issues that we're all um, grappling with today and, uh, and many other SDGs that we're all working towards. Um, so if you're, for instance, a smallholder farmer today and you don't have the basic access to financial services, that means that you cannot, um, there's no digital um, or non-digital audit trail of your transactions and activities. That means that your basically farm um, uh, business is very limited to um, what you're doing today. You cannot go and ask for credit, for loans, for uh, insurance and savings products. You cannot think of means of protecting your business and protecting uh, your employees as well. So um, it's an entry to many other, uh, basically, um, advanced services that hopefully we can all, we're all working towards offering to, uh, to the ex financially excluded. But at the same time, is, is about um, providing an opportunity for people to um, be able to um, build a life and build a business for themselves and focus on prosperity as well. Thank you very much, Nika. Leon, any? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't want to repeat what you've said because I, I agree with all of that. I think maybe um, a couple of points. If you're not included in the financial system, it's very difficult to access a lot of those services that you, that you talked about. On top of which, as a good friend of mine continually said, it is expensive to be poor. If you're poor, to access a lot of the financial services that you need, and people do find ways to access them, even if they're not financially included, it normally costs a lot more money, takes a lot more time. You're more reliant on other people who are probably in the financial system actually acting on your behalf. And that costs you something, whether it's emotionally or transactionally or whatever. Um, it, it, it's, it's a big deal. And I think if we look at this um, as well in terms of what you said, I think is exactly right, Nita. Financial inclusion is not an end to itself. And I'm sure most of you have looked at the World Bank's Findex um, report. The last one came out, I think, a couple of months ago, which was really interesting. I did write down some numbers to uh, bore you with, you with or excite you with. But actually, what was striking to me is if you look at this, there's a big difference between the number of people who actually own an account, so they physically have an account, and those who actually use it. So for me, it's not just about financial inclusion to say, oh, we've got 80% of people have access to the financial system. It's how many people are using it. So to give you some examples from the data of there, those people who've got, uh, who own a bank account in Africa was at 55% of people. So that actually means 45% of Africans don't have access to an account, which is a pretty alarming figure. Uh, and 50% of those in Africa actually use the account. So that's actually encouraging that most of those who have it use it. If you look at South Asia, it's 68% of people have an account, 
only 34% of those are actually using it. So only half of those people. So that's, a, you know, you've got to re we've got to understand why. And it's similar in some other regions. I think Middle East, 53% as opposed to 46%. Interestingly to me, even Europe uh, and Central Asia was only at 90%. I would have thought that should be closer to 100%. And 87% of people actually use their accounts. So even probably in the region we're sat in now, supposedly one of the most advanced regions, something like one in seven people is not using a formal account. And the problem with that is they can survive, but can they really progress as much as they want if they're excluded from the financial system? All right, I'll stop there. Okay, this allows me to ask the next question. Who delivers financial services to the unbanked now? And what they deliver? Um, I can go first. So again, I think the term unbanked, that means that there's one solution and that's the bank. So I think the correct question is that who delivers financial services to the financially excluded? Because banking is not the only option. It is the only option right now in the UK, but it's not the only option in, the, uh, in, in, in Africa. So, I mean, there's I hope it's not a news for any of us sitting in this room that mobile money has been the mainstay of financial inclusion in Africa. What the industry has achieved in 15 years is beyond what the banking industry has done in the past 100 years across uh, Europe in terms of bringing people to the formal financial uh, services space. So uh, my short answer to that is that there's no one service. Again, the context matters. We look at Africa and we've seen we can see that more than 50% of mobile money accounts globally are uh, from Africa today. Uh, and even looking at the Findex uh, um, report, you can see in a lot of markets where um, less than 50% of population have access to bank accounts, more than 50% of those uh, basically people own a, a mobile money account. So the ubiquity of mobile money account and the accessibility of mobile money account um, and the simplicity of mobile money accounts in, uh, across Africa um, has been the main uh, attractiveness around like uh, getting all these users onboarded into the formal financial services. That may not be the solution for the UK, banking or Europe. Uh, and we've seen what Alipay and WeChat have achieved in China um, through super apps. So my short answer to that is that is not one service. The context matters. It's mobile money in Africa, it's super apps in China, and in Southeast Asia, the likes of Grab, Gojek, etc., in Indonesia, uh, and mainly banks in Europe and US. So whether the picture will be the same in future, whether new banks and fintechs that we see today can play a different role, even in uh, advanced markets, we, um, there, there's. <laughs> Few year, we are a few years behind that, maybe 20 years still behind that, because I think banks will stay, will uh, play a big role. Um, and uh, I don't think there's a competition between any of these users, um, any of these services. So there is a, play, uh, a role that each of these services can play, whether uh, your bank, an MTO, um, a fintech, or mobile money, there is a space uh, and a role for each of them. Leon? Would you mind just repeating the question, so Who delivers financial services to the financial excluded or yeah. to the unbanked? Okay, well, <laughs> Nika's covered most of it, but I think I would say um, some of it, when we're saying the unbanked, I think that's problematic. And I think sometimes the question is, um, people use a lot of informal services. And what do we mean by informal services? Quite often we mean a, an entity that basically copies what a regulated business does but doesn't have a license. And those types of businesses, Hawala or whatever, are, you know, they are financial institutions, they're just not regulated or licensed in the same way. And for a large group of people, the unbanked um, or those excluded, that will be um, one of the service providers. Often people find um, coping mechanisms, I think, uh, the speaker from our far down this morning made the point that money will move if people want to move money, and that's exactly right. 
And I think we see lots of different coping strategies. One is quite often where somebody will use some, somebody who's got access to the system as a conduit to be able to um, send or receive money or do whatever services they want. People will find solutions. I think a lot of it is um, either, and, and actually, to be fair, if you look at some of the, let's say, uh, informal mechanisms that are used, they're used also because they're very efficient. And sometimes a lot of businesses that are regulated and registered have tried to copy some of the good things that those businesses do because they find a solution. And I think that's where we can see more and more um, harmonization, hopefully, with uh, trying to reduce the number of informal services or unregistered services that are out there, but by either finding ways to bring them in, if we can cope with the KYC in the compliance areas, or copying the best bits that they do and improving on that. Uh, thank you very much, Leon. I mean, we know that in Africa, mobile operators are very successful. I mean, recruiting the unbanked. Okay. Uh, the question is, what obstacle, legal infrastructure, agents, etc., are blocking MTOs or banks from catching up with mobile operators? For you. For me. Okay. Yes, madam. <laughs> Ladies, always first. <laughs> So I think, uh, okay, I'm going to question the question here. What obstacles, um, are, I mean, what types of obstacles are blocking MTOs or banks from catching up with mobile operators in Africa? I think there's a role for everyone to be played. So I don't think there, there should be a competition between any of these three players. They can uh, play a very complementary role to each other. So for instance, fundamentals of mobile money is that whatever you have as e-money, you have to have the equivalent of that sitting in a trust account that is held by a bank. So as a mobile money provider, you're not in, crea in, in the business of creating money. So that, um, we talk about telcos versus banks a lot, but in reality, there is a strong partnership between banks and telcos uh, that we cannot deny. And the, there are services that telcos cannot offer and they have to offer it in partnerships with banks. For instance, um, credit, uh, we see M-Pesa, for instance, has this m service that is very successful in uh, providing microloans, uh, and that is a partnership between um, Safaricom and um, CBA, if I'm not mistaken, I forgot. So um, you see there is a complementary law and there is a different role for each player um, in the value chain. So um, I wouldn't say that banks need to catch up with telcos. Banks need to work on uh, their core strengths, and that is ring fencing customer funds, ensuring that um, there's a regulatory license in place, etc. And for telcos, um, they don't have an ambition to become a full bank. I mean, we saw Orange, for instance, getting a license to become Orange uh, for the Orange Bank Africa, and you know, you're in the region. It's not really going well for them because they don't have the, for the moment, but they don't have the expertise to run it, and it's. Uh, very different. Um, so it's, I see the mobile money industry moving towards um, the platform play. At the same time, I see more innovation happening on the banking side. More banks across Africa are embracing a digital strategy. And there is an opportunity to basically um, close the gap that is between underbanked, people who have a bank account and they're not using it. The, uh, going back to the point that Leon mentioned on the usage and the usage gap, uh, or the bank customers and mobile money users. So what we need to look at more and more is not competition, but more of a co-operation that everyone operates, but they have um, um, cooperates, but they have a um, healthy outlook on, on their revenues and how they can service the customers better. But at the same time, there is less friction in terms of movements between these different uh, movements of funds between these different channels and instruments. So more interoperability between banks and uh, telcos and also MTOs uh, and telcos and banks. And I think they each have a different uh, role to play in the value chain. Leon, any? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question because and just listening to your answer, Nika, which as ever I always agree with, but um, I think 
when you look at MNOs and you look at banks, you can clearly see the role for them. I think the question is, what is the role for the um, MTO within all of that? They're specialists. I think there's clearly a role to educate um, the mobile operators, because I think at the end of the day, the way they're running their cross-border payments leaves a, leaves a lot to, uh, to be improved upon. I think what they have is massive customer bases that they're able to leverage, but they're not very transparent. The services don't seem to work as efficiently as you would need. I'm not sure they really understand how to educate the customers who want to use the uh, money transfer services. So I think you know, there's a role for money transfer services in that area and also clearly in bringing money in from other parts of the globe. Um, but I'm not clear whether, how sustainable that is if the mobile operators got it right. And I think from a bank's viewpoint, I think banks have to be very clear what is their role. Are we the product provider you know, in a, a value-added services? Are we the provider of services actually to, whether it's money transfer operators or mobile operators? Are we both? And a lot of it comes down to who owns the customer ultimately and therefore who owns the customer. They're the people actually who are the ones who should have most of the power to then source in the products. And so it's a question of where is each entity on the value chain and how can they both protect that but really deliver proper value there. Totally agree with that point. Yeah, I think I totally agree that with that point of like the synergies between MTOs and the telco and the mobile money players not understanding remittances fully. If you recall the first time that we did the cost study together in GSMA, none of the operators had price transparency. And when we spoke to them, they didn't even know that they have to like expose their FX rates, etc., to the consumers when they were doing cross-border remittances. Um, and I remember in one of these studies, mystery shopping studies that we did together, they even told like the customer, uh, the mystery shopper had to call their um, um, customer support and they're like, just Google the rate. Um, so, and when we spoke to them, they, don't, they didn't understand the product. They didn't, still to this day, uh, the, the understanding of the remittances pillar is not there. And uh, the user journey and MTOs are arguably far better at um, diaspora engagement, at um, offering a seamless customer experience to uh, remittance senders than mobile money services. They're more of generalists. And this is where, for instance, players like us in First Africa, we have to do a lot of hand-holding. We do this mystery shopping with DMA, actually, to understand the customer experience, though we are a B2B company, because we wanna, our goal is to enhance these intra-African remittances. And we realize that the UX and UI is still not there. Part of it is because of USSD menu, but part of it is because of that inherent low understanding of the product. And also we see some MNOs are working with MTOs in Africa actually, um, beyond what they do from global, sending money from global north to south in terms of piggybacking on their license and sending out of markets where they don't have licensing. Uh, what do you think about those who are saying that, I mean, banks who are saying that MNOs are threats for them? And they are, I mean, departing from banks, looking for their own uh, licenses. And banks as well are trying to get their USSSD and have the, I mean, necessary to, uh, the, the telephone ships to be able to offer the same services at the telcos. I mean, this is a situation we are, I mean, seeing in many parts of Africa, Equity Bank, for example, if you remember, okay. they got their own chip to offer their own service. And the telcos are not only a threat for banks, they are, but they are a major threat for uh, microfinance institutions because they are targeting the same clients. And those clients are shifting from microfinance institutions to telcos, okay? And the financial institution now, I mean, many of them, they see the telcos as threat and they want to fight them. Uh, that is why we ask this question, I mean, to have your uh, thoughts. Okay, thank you very much. Let me go to the next question because we do not have uh, much time. Um, 
Uh, now we come to our friends, the central banks. <laughs> what, role, what role does the central banks and government have to play in financial inclusion for you? Do you want to go first before I yeah. say something? Ned, I feel like <laughs> yeah, you've I done well like here. You're obviously yeah. safe, keeping your power to drive this for is, later. This is great. Uh, I, mean, I think, um, I don't know whether it's central banks, but governments basically have the key role. Sorry, did you want to say anything before no, I no, just I jumped in? No, I <laughs> but, said governments. Um, yeah, yeah. But central but banks during COVID took very strong, I mean, action. Yeah, yeah. so we're mm. talking about financial inclusion mm -hmm. here. So central banks are sort of an organ implementing government policy. And mm -hmm. I think, as, well, except in the UK probably, I'm not sure, but um, I think what we're really seeing is that government has to basically drive and set the policy for financial inclusion. And the central bank will be one of the entities, along with the Ministry of Finance, that needs to put in place government level programs. So whether that's school education starting there and then moving out from there. But I think one of the things we see is there's not really much interaction with the service providers. So the money transfer operators, the MNOs. I mean, really government should be coming out with initiatives when anybody, if you're trying to get people to uh, um, adopt accounts or whatever, working with the service providers on an educational level. And by that, I don't mean marketing. We heard a lot about marketing earlier today. But I mean actually education, um, helping people understand both the benefits and the risks of the products. And to my mind, if everything we've seen is if we leave that to the product providers to um, implement those on their own back, you will get a vast variety of results. Some will be really good and very educational. Others will just be glorified sales messages for their product, regardless of the risk. And I think what you need to do is to set an overall environment and probably either a set of standards or guidelines or something that all service providers need to be able to sign up to. So probably not the best example, but you talked about transparency. You know, we see in the EU, I think you're all familiar with Payment Services Directive, I think in the US we've got the CFPB, have very clear standards, and I know in the US in particular, some quite hefty fines being levied on companies who can afford to pay them, from what I can see, um, that are actually being done for people who don't provide transparent information, whether it's how you get a refund or how much it's going to cost you and so on. And where that's happening, that's much better at bringing transparency than lots of other countries. And you use the example of the cross-border mobile payment. We're appalled at how many mobile operators you are not able to actually hear, learn how much the receiver is going to get. And in some cases, where the amount that's actually sent and you're told you're going to get is completely different to the amount that's actually collected by the other person. So, there's a lot deeper level than that, but I think the government has to take the lead uh, and work and bring in the private sector service providers to be able to actually deliver on that promise. Yeah, and if I want to maybe add to that, um, I think first of all, one of the points that um, Leon mentioned was the financial inclusion being part of their strategy. So we see a lot of Ministry of Finance that have a financial inclusion strategy um, is this a core part of their plan for the country? That's something that uh, uh, usually moves the needle. Then capacity building. Um, a lot of these new innovative products uh, are there and the regulators don't have the capacity to look at them. Uh, and they don't understand the product and obviously nature of being a regulator, you're risk averse and anything that is not a bank is a risk to your uh, to the financial stability of your country. Uh, so having, uh, creating that capacity um, to look at innovation and creating an environment which is open and a leveled playing field that you're open to hear from innovators in the market, whether they're telcos, whether they're fintech players, whether they're MTOs, um, that is key. And also whenever they're making a decision on certain policies, in ensuring that they have a very balanced governance structure. So when you look at, and recently I was looking at certain like agent aggregation 
a regulation in Nigeria, it was written purely based on what InterSwitch wanted to get in the market because there were no other players. And in terms of drafting uh, the regulation, do you invite others who are the, um, players in the ecosystem to give them a seat around the table and uh, create policies that are inclusive and uh, conducive to the whole um, financial ecosystem and not, they're not geared towards only banks, for instance. Um, and then the other point that I really love is financial literacy and uh, accessibility. So what we see, for instance, in the core telco business is that in the UK, is if Ofcom is going to give you bandwidth as a telco provider to um, in basically uh, spread your, uh, uh, to have more base stations, etc., they give you a target of uh, saying that you need to cover rural areas. So with your license, you are basically um, uh, mandated to uh, cover 80% of rural areas, etc. We don't see that on the financial services side. Do we really care about the rural areas, the bottom of pyramid, people who really don't have access to financial services? And we need to think about those metrics if you're getting a license, part of your license should be that you're not going to over-index and only target, let's say, Lagos and Nairobi. You really need to have a strategy around being inclusive and going to rural areas and really move the needle to the truly financially uh, excluded um, population. And as part of that, I agree to have financial literacy programs uh, in place. And that is not marketing. That is more financial education. Uh, basically creating awareness around the fact that if you don't have, if you don't store your um, money in, in, uh, in your basically pillow, uh, it's going to be safe, you can, you, know, you can have access to it. What are the other benefits of having a uh, basic um, um, financial um, base store of value, whether it's mobile money, bank, or MFIs, et cetera? Okay. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, financial literacy and the license. What other challenges you think, I mean, mobile payment operators or technology company have to improve financial inclusion? So what other challenges? Um, I would say telcos, they have a challenge, most of them right now, that's called Wave, which is very active in your market. So I think one of the challenges is being part of a legit, like, um, Mobile money providers, they used to be innovators, but they're becoming the incumbents right now. When you cannot be nimble and move as fast as uh, your competitors are, the likes of Wave, then you're losing out on what is happening. And uh, the main challenge that I see the industry is having is being able to really spin off in a, 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 in a success, uh, successful way. So we've seen, for instance, Airtel trying to spin off their financial services, MTN is going down the same route, but does that mean that the funding that they raise, they have this, they're going to use it in the same way that a player like Wave uses? So changing, shifting that mentality across the board that you should not really focus on squeezing every cent out of um, per, um, uh, per transaction and have a broader view. That is something that if you talk to most mobile money providers, they don't even have any decision making around that, that those decisions are being made um, in, across the groups, et cetera. So shifting their mentality and uh, spinning off their services, really um, decoupling their services from the telco and the telco mentality to be able to be more agile and nimble. Uh, we have less than five minutes left. Let me go to the other question uh, very fast. Um, how will interoperability between banks and teleco telcos benefit the end users for you? Interoperability between banks and telco. Will it benefit to the end users? What's that? Well, no, I, I mean, yeah. do you want to go? No, I mean, no, no you're good. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> We're all looking vacant at this one because I, I think we've sort of. is our kind of what we do. Yeah. I can talk about it, but I feel like I've been speaking a lot. So. No, I, <laughs> I mean, I think clearly it comes back to what we were saying before about partnerships, each doing what they do best better or the best for a customer really. So um, it's understanding the roles for banks, understanding the roles for MTOs, understanding their roles, their specializations. I think your point about specialization is exactly right. And then 
together as a combination, then delivering for consumers in whatever area it is, and if it's financial inclusion or improved product offerings, um, that's clearly it. And it's going to be different for each country, but um, to me, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Yeah, do you want to I, I, I just back that up. I think I've been listening to you, and I, I think what, all what ties us together is that you know banks are, in some cases, a necessary evil. Um, they they serve a purpose, um, but people, um, you know, they don't always need banks. And fintechs typically are there to try and create products that banks are either too lazy to do or, or just don't have the resources to do. So I think there's a there's a mix between the two. We we, we rely on banks for for certain things, but the whole point of um, delivering new products to, to customers is having fintechs that, that specialise in a particular area and can deliver those products. And I think that happens globally, to be honest, in, in most markets. Maybe we have two minutes. Can I interject? Or... So basically, on, on interoperability, um, fragmentation is holding us back. And that means that between these, these instruments, you cannot move funds easily. So if you're, for instance, let's say you're selling um, your crops, um, cross borders, you receive funds, you have to split that fund into three different um, instruments. You have to convert some part of it to cash to pay your suppliers, some part of it to mobile money to pay your uh, basically um, employees, and some parts of it uh, in, into a bank account to um, move funds uh, to MFIs or to your savings account. So um, if there is no fragmentation, these things can be done smoothly between different uh, payment channels and um, it reduces a lot of like inefficiencies in the system but also um, it provides users with one single view and all of uh, the headache of converting uh, their transactions between physical, online, informal, formal, etc. Okay, one last question. <laughs> what progress should we expect to see in the years to come and what advancements needs to happen? Final question for all of you. Uh, good question. Uh, I think people are innovating all the time. So um, as, as companies um, understand markets better, as companies understand compliance and regulation better, um, I think pro new products are going to be you know, developed and it's only going to be, get better for the consumer. A big part of this actually I think is, is down to financial literacy in my opinion. A lot of, and we were talking about this earlier, you know, some people are really skeptical about new products. Some people are, you know, just d dive head first. And I think it comes down to how well developed maybe your financial ecosystem has been built. You know, as we said, in, in the East, they don't mind, you know, in China, they don't mind paying for stuff on, on, on one app. But in Europe, particularly in the UK, we're all quite skeptical about giving away our, our details to companies that we don't know and sharing data. So um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in financial literacy. but there's new products being launched all the time to try and you know, solve real problems. And so it's difficult to say what's going to happen, but I think the, the gap between new fintech companies and banks or traditional organizations is going to get closer, and that's ultimately going to benefit the end consumers. I'm going to give you the last word, so, <laughs> I will, uh, so I'll go before you. Is that all right? Um, but may, I mean, I think, you know, in a nutshell, clearly things are going to advance at different paces in different parts of the world, but in 10 years' time, we'll be in a completely different place. Now, there'll be a, a lot more um, financial inclusion using some of the tools we're talking about, whether it's super apps, probably in large parts of the world, it will be mobile driven, whether it's one app or multiple apps, I don't really know. But I do think it, you know, what's most important is understanding what on earth the customer wants. And secondly, which we probably haven't talked about much, is there are still parts of the world where it's very difficult to get a mobile signal, where it's very difficult, there are still parts where it's very difficult to get electricity. So one of the first things we have to do is to improve that basic, basic, basic infrastructure. And then once we do that, what we put on that infrastructure or those rails should be much more straightforward once people have got the tools. So it will be better than it is now anyway. I think Leon uh, stole my point on oh, infrastructure. <laughs> That's why I wanted to go before you. Yes. So I think uh, everything that I wanted to say was said, but I think the only one of the key barriers for financial inclusion is access to identity. And um, 
we are basically when we, we look at uh, continents such as Latam and Africa, we're very behind access to foundational identity. And this is where we need regulators and also innovators to think about solutions that can re, um, fill in the gap. Um, we're looking at um, close to, I, I don't remember the uh, numbers, but close to 2 billion people, I think, across the world don't have access to foundational IDs. Um, apart from connectivity, electricity, roads, and infrastructures that are fundamental for financial inclusion, identity is another one that we need to, uh, we need more innovation and more uh, collaboration between public and private sector on that front. Uh, thank, thank you for your answers to the first group of questions. We now have questions coming from the online participants. In the room as well. In the room, okay. Ah, okay. The audience, sorry. You've answered all the questions. Any question, please? <laughs> Very shy audience. Yeah. We've got questions from online, so, so let's go to online. Um, so a question from uh, Kelvin. What is the relationship between super app and open banking, open finance, which has embedded finance as part of its value proposition? Ned? Yeah. This is for Ned. Uh, yeah, I'd argue that um, open bank, well, super apps don't just embody open banking or, or open finance. So as I said, it's a, a user interface that will combine multiple consumable services. So whether that's finance or, you know, dining out or, 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 or booking a, uh, a, a taxi, it's, it's kind of almost like a marketplace of apps that are within one user interface. Um, I'd say that open banking is just one, one payment method, one use of collecting data, viewing data. So there's definitely a link between the two, but there's certainly places in the world that could have a super app without ever having access to open banking at, at, at all. So hopefully that's answered the question. Yeah, okay, thank you, Ned. Um, a couple of questions around barriers to super bank, uh, sorry, super app. So uh, if he asked, what, uh, what's the major barrier to super app in Africa? And Zishan also asked, why is the West being slower than its Chinese counterpart uh, in creating a super app? Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so. Personally, I think it comes back to what we were talking about. It's, it's education. It's, it's what the consumer actually wants. I don't think that the West necessarily has a yearning for a super app. I think people are confused. Um, the people that, or the companies that are doing super apps at the moment or aspiring to be super apps, they're doing it okay, but it's, it's a mixed match of different services that are being delivered through uh, an interface rather than being a really clear... Um, solution that's been given as, as like the only solution that you can use. So I think in the West it's, it's, it's not been adopted because I don't think we need it. There's good enough apps you know, on your phone that you can move around and, and use um, that, that, we, that it's, it, has, it just hasn't come up yet. Um, that's, that's my opinion anyway. Um, I'll let you guys go with the second part or the first part. Maybe, maybe the question around like in Africa they said, what is the barriers? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think Leon mentioned this before, access to smartphones. And what we see is basically even when people have own a smartphone, there is a, cover, uh, there's a usage gap. So when you look at the mobile internet coverage in the past five years, Sub-Saharan Africa has had one of the biggest growth actually uh, compared to other re uh, regions, but it had the widest basically gap between coverage and usage. Um, and that is because cost of accessing mobile internet is high. Um, and we haven't seen any innovation on that front. What we saw in India, for, for instance, with Geo, was that they were in um, <coughs> driving a, a movement which was both um, enabling coverage, 4G coverage and mobile internet coverage, but at the same time thinking about access to smartphones and the geo phones and bringing, slashing the cost of uh, access to mobile internet. And you see um, India uh, access um, usage and coverage gap in India has closed down. We haven't seen that in, uh, in Africa, so it would be access to smartphones, cost of mobile data, um, tech literacy, um, understanding how, uh, what to do with the phone. I remember 
there was this study that uh, was done a few years back by WIF that they asked people um, what is mobile internet and they said Facebook. Um, so, and most of the time I remember we were doing some research on the field, people were saying that, okay, uh, their, their, their news basically outlet was Facebook as well because they didn't have that tech literacy. Um, so it's a combination of all of these access to smartphones, mobile internet coverage, uh, cost of smartphone uh, and basic uh, feature phones that are more smart and uh, tech literacy. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Zishan, a uh, question for Ned. What support does Currency Cloud provide to small money transfer startups who are looking to increase their capacity and growth prospects, especially those with or in the process of getting SPI licenses? Do you have a regulatory sandbox that helps with getting authorization? Um, it's a good question. So, without doing a uh, uh, selfish um, sales pitch, Currency Cloud works with all, like a number of different companies of all sizes. So, um, we basically offer a suite of APIs um, to companies who want to leverage the technology that we've got across the globe. Generally, where there's a border involved, that's where Currency Cloud come into our own. Um, I think for small businesses, and I speak to lots of different companies, all the way from SPIs all the way up to big EMIs, the thing that we would always, always, always start off with is, have you got a good foundation? Have you got a good regulatory foundation to work from? And what are the key markets that you're, that you're looking to, to expand into or, or even just a service? Um, I'd say specifically, it's probably better just to come and talk to, to me and my team um, after the call. Um, but we don't have a regulatory sandbox. You know, we are a, we're a technology company for, first and foremost. So if you're a regulated entity and you want to leverage our, our global um, payment rails, and that's kind of where we would sit. So we, we, we operate a very much B to B to X model where the X is the customer and the, then the second B is, is our customer. Um, so I hope that answers the question, but we, we partner with companies um, who, you know, who can offer regulatory advice, um, but that, yeah, it's probably better have a, have a conversation offline. Sure, sure, okay, thanks. Uh, one more question, Zishan, again. Uh, will we see any further innovation in payments, including uh, including integration for Alexa, Siri, and Google? Uh, in apps? Uh, I guess so, yeah. Uh, maybe. I mean, it's terrifying, but yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't be letting an AI device look after my finances. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know how the regulator would think about that, but potentially. I mean, if somebody wanted to release a, a, an application that was, that was driven off, off that, then good luck to them. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to weigh in on that? <laughs> well, I mean, anybody knows, but I suppose we're set up here because we might have an opinion on it. My guess is I don't see why not is in the longer term. I don't see why not. If people want to use it, and it makes it easier for them. And obviously it's voice recognition in combination with some other safeguards, then I, I don't really understand why it wouldn't happen. And actually, I would have thought there's pro you're probably already able to do it in some, with some apps that are out there. I could be wrong, but... Um, yeah, I was thinking that probably someone is doing it already. Yeah. Um, but it really depends on demand. I think if there's demand for it, why not? Again, you were mentioning in UK, we are skeptic about <laughs> <laughs> our personal data, I am, um, but it might be that in other markets people are not, yeah. I'd like to see a use case. <laughs> I'd like to see a business case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is actually another question. Uh, this is for Nika. Uh, what, what's, what's her thought, what's your thought around mobile money, mobile money in Nigeria? So I think that's the... For me, that's the biggest, um, this year is the biggest year for uh, Nigeria. Um, first of all, we don't know these payments, uh, bank services in Nigeria, how they're going to evolve. <laughs> We've seen India and it's very similar um, and based on the model in India and it hasn't been a success in India. Out of, I think, 15 uh, uh, payments banks, licenses that were given in principle in India, only six survived and out of those six, three after many years are um, managing. Uh, 
Um, so it's, we don't have a good story in India, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to work in um, Nigeria because uh, it's a bit complex. It has to be part, partially physical, partially digital. Um, they're not allowed to offer credit services, etc. But uh, Nigeria is one of the most populous countries across Africa. We coined this term at GSM. We used to call it the sleeping giant of mobile money. And when you look at outside Lagos, uh, the un, uh, on back, financially excluded population is huge. Um, and what I've, I've seen so far is that MTN and Airtel, who've recently launched in uh, May, June, they're all eyeing the uh, outside the Lagos uh, population. So it will be for, for it to really um, sustainably and commercially um, survive, we need to need uh, see uh, new uh, forms of partnerships that are very different from what we've seen in East Africa or West Africa. Um, and I'm uh, one of those who are, who are eyeing the market very eagerly, uh, seeing what the innovation is going to come up uh, out of Nigeria. But the partnerships will be different. I think for everyone, this year is all about Nigeria and uh, what innovations we'll see in the market. Uh, just one quick question for Ned. Um, First of all, I'd uh, like to say that it's very, very nice to see that Visa hasn't really um, curtailed uh, currencies clouds offering to many smaller uh, payment institution or uh, fintech or an EMI. And I hope it continues like that and you won't start to risk in the sector. Um, finally, do you see in the future um, maybe an uptake and a um, on crypto uh, with regards to um, stable coin? Never mind the other coins, but there is a different definite use case in this sector mm. but I know that there is a reluctance a reluctancy by currency cloud to on the roadmap to actually offer that um, service uh, yeah so so first of all uh, for those of you that don't know yeah we were bought by visa at the beginning of this year um, in answer to your specific question we we are very much still currency cloud so you know we run our own agenda um, we support all kinds of businesses it's not just going to be one one specific type um, if anything, we're going to start supporting more businesses because we have a bright, broader risk appetite. Um, on the crypto side, it's uh, you know if I if I could say we could accept crypto, <laughs> I'd be a much richer man. Um, unfortunately, you know it comes down to, to to risk ultimately. So some companies are really good at supporting crypto, particularly on the on ramp off ramp. Um, at the moment, the risk appetite from Currency Cloud is that we can't support it because of some of our providers that we work with as well. So I, I, I wouldn't want to give you a timeline <laughs> on, on when we might be able to do it. But at the moment, there are some, some use cases where we've seen stablecoin um, denominated you know, companies come to us and we're doing some work with them that, where we can segregate the crypto. But generally, if there's crypto involved, then it's just a risk appetite um, thing at the moment. But more than happy to stay in contact about that in the future. I've got one more. There's a, one more question. What do you consider, this is from Shabnam, what do you consider to be the most important payment innovation in the digital age? <laughs> West Africa. <laughs> do you want to go? I Payment innovation. Yeah, sure, your source. I mean, well, so you should just say mobile money, shouldn't you? I, really? I was going to say MFS Africa, but then I would be biased. <laughs> um, I would, yeah, I think mob, mobile money would be one of the one of the most in it, innovative um, solutions we've seen. And um, if you look at the basic mobile money, it, compared to super apps, it, it, it's no frill. It's very simple. But in terms of the impact and number of users that it has brought to the, uh, uh, to the form of financial services, it has done wonders. So I would say the simplicity, uh, the operating model, um, et cetera, makes it one of the most innovative uh, services we've seen. Uh, I'm a bit uh, crypto skeptic, but I think apart from that, distributed le ledger technology as well. Uh, and in terms of, um, uh, some of the innovation and in efficiencies that you see, especially in payments that um, has a lot of different intermediaries, um, is the second, I think, innovative solution after more money. 
Um, I'm going to go completely different and sort of broaden the question, but actually I think I'm coming from looking at where there are some specific problems that a solution has been developed to. And I think our friends from uh, Hello Group this morning really alluded to that to me, is when in times of crisis we're using technology in combination with distribution to actually get value or goods to people who desperately need them because you can't send money because it's devaluing so much. So to me, that was a specific, those are specific examples of where um, technology has played a role in sending the message, but it's been combined with a real human need that needs to be so, solved at that particular time uh, and is still going on and has been adapted. So for me, that's a different type of innovation and very specific, but for me, you know, that, that's really encouraging that people can find very specific solutions to people who are desperate for them. Yeah, I mean, in my lifetime, I, I, I might be a bit controversial, but I think like e-money to me, just, you know, there's so many possibilities that, that it's, it's unlocked, particularly around, um, well, like with COVID, for example, when people had no choice but to go digital um, and the opportunity that that created, but also having, you know, a settlement that's much, much quicker than traditional, you know, banking methods, or so they say. Um, but there's loads. I mean, I think I, I don't think we've really scratched the surface with open banking. I think they do it a lot better in the US. Um, so I'd say probably a combination of the two. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, they, they, they said the ZipZap machine was quite, you know, influential 50 years ago. So <laughs> you don't know. Thank you.